Hi, I'm here today to speak about how you can use FOSS to develop bare metal software. What does bare metal software mean? It basically means any kind of software where you don't have an operating system running underneath. So you're really close to the metal, to the processor itself. I work for a company called Next Silicon. We build computer chips for high performance computing. If you're interested in bare metal software or HPC, come find me afterwards. Um, this is our plan for today. Basically, we're going to be booting a simple RISC-V chip. And we're going to think about how we can develop a software that boots this RISC-V chip in a way that we can be sure that when we start this chip, it will actually work. Because the problem is, if I develop for hardware, I cannot just run it on my laptop because it's a discrete piece of hardware that the code is supposed to run on, right? So all of the nasties of modern software development, I now have to slowly re-establish. And that's basically what we're trying to do in this talk, using open source software. So what does our chip look like? Uh, our chip looks generally has two parts of memory. One is um, we have uh, uh, EEPROM, so we have read-only memory and we have random access memory. We do have some onboard IPs uh, that basically means hardware blocks that do different functions. I will go into what those are. And we assume we have offboard devices for sake of uh, shortness and to get you all to lunch soon. I will not be going into those uh, deeply. And our goals are reliable firmware. What does that mean for me? It means when I boot the chip, I want it to actually boot and not to crash and send me to long nights of debugging uh, with, with scopes and whatever to get some information out of my chip. And I want minimal hardware and licenses needed because especially in the hardware world, it can be very expensive to get even a single seed of a license for testing. And also, um, if, I, if I actually get the license, I may need an FPGA board to test something or I need, may need a very big server which again precludes my developers, in this case me, from just running the tests locally on my laptop. And I really enjoy running it locally on my laptop, that also is, yeah. So this is the plan for today. Basically, we have our firmware, we compile that using GCC, and we get two artifacts from that. One is we get a binary, so a bin file, which is just stripped down everything that really needs to be on the device. And then we also get an out file, which will come in handy later, because that's where all of the nice debugging information will be stored. Um, we will also have a config.bin, uh, which is basically just a dummy file representing all of the values that will be present in the system. In the real system, this will not be a file, but the system itself will provide all of those values. It's basically whatever the hardware exposes, right? But we need to get it into our software. Um, to emulate the device itself, we use QEMU. Uh, if you want to know more about QEMU, uh, we will touch briefly on it today. Uh, but you can watch my talk from last year, where I give a little bit more of a broad overview of how to do QEMU work. And then, finally, to test it, we will look into how to change GB and PyTest to get that good unit test or flow test feeling of just hitting run, knowing everything works. And uh, this is basically the plan. And we'll start with QEMU to get you kind of an oversight of what this device actually looks like. So as I said, we're doing a RISC-V processor. And RISC-V, as you may have heard, is a modular architecture. Um, so it has different kinds of extensions. For example, you're not guaranteed that every processor supports atomic instructions. You're not guaranteed that every processor uh, supports compressed instructions. For the sake of ease, I have assumed it supports what is generally called GC, G for general, that is this IMAFD, and then C for compressed instructions, and then supervisor and user mode for good measure. But the nice thing about this uh, in QEMU is I can just drop those, and if my compiler actually still emits those, or any software I'm trying to run includes those, QEMU will yell at me, and I won't have to debug which instruction went wrong on the device, I can just directly into QEMU see like, oh, it's that opcode that's there in the memory and this is what created it. It's way easier to do that. So that's why it's nice to have this flexibility, not just in the instruction set, but in QEMU itself. Uh, 
this is what our device actually looks like. Uh, so the memory map. In hardware, you don't really have APIs. You just have memory addresses that you poke and uh, read from, and that's basically all that the API, all the API that hardware provides you. We don't have anything super interesting. We have some ROM. We have some RAM, as I said before. We have straps, which is basically pins uh, that reach to the outside and then get configured at like they read the values, you apply to them at boot, and then they expose it. That way you can tell your processor, for example, or your chip, whether it's supposed to be booting in a development mode or in a real mode or whatever. Uh, and then uh, we have UART and SPI interfaces. I will be aligning the SPI for today, as I said. We will focus on the UART uh, to, to keep things simple. And uh, in QEMU, uh, they have this concept of a memory map entry, which is a nice way of, um, of storing where it is, so the ad base address and the size, and we will use those entries just now. So for the actual memory, it's not that, uh, again, not that hard. Basically, you tell it uh, to, to get you the general system memory, and then you say, I want a new memory region for my RAM. You initialize that memory region. Uh, you give it the name. QMU allows you by a property system to access that. And then you just add it as a subregion. Because QMO basically models memory as a hierarchical tree, that's why we needed this uh, system memory at the beginning so that we can just mount the RAM into there. Okay, passive devices. So our straps, we can also model as memory, we <laughs> model them as raw. Uh, because we probably the device doesn't allow us to change anything. And again, it's basically the same thing. We do the ROM, we uh, we mount it as a, a subregion into the system memory, so you actually still need this pointer from up here, the system memory pointer. It's the same thing for, for your QM device instance, uh, so nothing big there. And we'll see how we get the values in, in a bit. For UART, it's a little bit more involved, but thankfully UART is super standardized, so we don't need to think about which kind of UART IP are we using. 90% is just the same device. Uh, and thankfully, QMO already uh, has really nice support there. There is some things that are not obvious. For example, the register width is specified in, bit, uh, in shifts. So two actually means my registers are four byte wide. And also, I need an interrupt handler. Um, we currently just provide an empty function because that interrupt handler is for getting the interrupt when somebody types something in. We don't care about that. We're not interactive. We're just booting. We don't want to see the user. And your, the backend is nice because that actually prints it into the URL standard out, so you can see if you want to print something. Okay, putting it together, now we compile all of that into our machine. We call it Cosmos Demo. And we can tell it uh, which firmware to load. Uh, this should be firmware loading, but same difference. And we can tell it to also uh, load arbitrary data at arbitrary addresses. So this is this device loader which is really nice if you want to see multiple different configurations booting, right? You can just uh, have uh, parameterized over that field and everything is nice. And then the last two are my favorite. Uh, I always get them confused because they're super similar and they come together like you know, butter and jelly. Uh, one opens the debug port uh, for GB on TCP port 1234 and the other one boots it in single step mode, uh, starts QMO in single step mode which means it won't start running, because if you do that, what you will see is only the aftermath, and if you want to like see in between steps to check that certain things are true, um, then, then you definitely want to start in uh, single step mode. Also, if you're debugging, you, you don't want it to already be after the crash, right? You want it to be before, so that you can set up your breakpoints. Okay, so here I'm done. Now we get to building. And the building, we will really only focus on the linking because that can often be the hard part. And if you remember, um, uh, so this is basically what we want to place. We have some read-only data, we have some normal data, we have some static data that is zero in the beginning. We have a heap, we have a stack, we have uh, our code, which is called text. Um, and if you remember, I told you we have, uh, we have ROM and we have RAM. And so our question basically is, where does what go? Um, so, it, we can do that by mutability, right? Everything that doesn't need to be mutated can go to ROM. Everything that we want to mutate goes to RAM. 
that's a good first approach. And that's actually kind of what we need. Remember, probably RAM needs to be built by us. So the second thing we can split about is by initialization. Is it in the bin file that we produce, or does the program organically build? And did you notice something in between those two slides? Yeah? yeah? Data move to RAM. Yeah, and that's a problem, right? We want data to be initialized in the beginning, but also we need data to be mutable. Um, you could write your firmware in a way that you do not have this problem, right? Where you say everything, every global piece of data is uh, uninitialized, or I don't have global data. Um, sometimes you can't avoid it, maybe if you use some libraries. Um, and it can be nice to have default uh, initialized values in, in that. For example, if your heap allocator uh, needs some, some data to figure out uh, where the boundary is that it's trying to allocate, uh, stuff like that. So now is the question, okay, how do we tell the linker to place something uh, in ROM at, at uh, link time, at compile time, but actually everything that depends on it should look at for it in a different location, right? Um, and how you do that is with this little piece of magic, probably you will uh, want to look at the slides afterwards, but basically you can tell it, place it, expect all the memory to be located in RAM, like all the symbols will be in RAM, but, it, uh, but actually place them into ROM. And then it's your job as the developer, uh, either in C or in assembly, you usually start in assembly, uh, to move all that data around. And thankfully, you get some symbols. Uh, you actually can also create a symbol that points to the ROM location. And so you just write a small function to copy it all over and box your own uh, So now we have our system up and running. We have our firmware compiled. We have it all in QML. Now is the actually interesting part, which is making sure this actually boots in a way that we can be confident that it will also boot in the final system. For that, we want tests. We want lots of tests. And to get those tests, we need insight, right? We need a way to check what our code is doing. And for that, as I said before, QML provides a GED interface. And so we'll start with that. So I can just connect to this uh, port by a target remote. And I can even load my symbol file. As I said before, we have this nice L where all of my debug information is stored. If uh, build that has uh, debug information. And then I can set breakpoints, I can continue, I can hit the breakpoints, everything is nice. However, I want to automate this, and this does not look like the most machine-readable format to me. Thankfully, GDB uh, exposes something called the machine interface, uh, or machine mode, and um, this is basically what it looks like. You recognize the commands by the dash at the beginning, and it will spew back at you something that is not very human readable, but very machine readable. Now, I still don't want to write parser for that myself, so thankfully, somebody wrote, already did it, the wonder of open source, somebody wrote a Python binding for that, and so basically what we can do is we can just tell it um, where our GP is located, which interpreter to use, and um, then, as before, we load the symbol file. In this case, we can already extract it. We tell it, we tell it to connect. We can tell it to hit the breakpoint. And then, once we execute, and this one will actually be a blocking write, like it waits until it gets this response from GDB, then we get a response. And this response is basically the same as we saw here. So if you follow this path, payload frame function, um, sorry, you can see that we have the, um, the frame function. Exactly. So we have the payload, that's the whole thing, then we have the frame here, and then we have the function, so we can check that the breakpoint that we hit, hit is actually the breakpoint that we wanted to hit. Why is this important? Well, as a first test case, you can say, well, I have an uh, exception handler, for example, if I did an invalid memory read, and that goes to a different address, and I have a normal finish address, and I just put breakpoints at both of them, I run a program and I can see <coughs> whether it succeeded or whether it failed. That's a great thing. Now, I probably want more information than just did it succeed or did it fail, right? I may want to check, like, are all the values correct? And for that, thankfully, there's a lot of different way 
ways uh, to, to extract uh, um, information. The first one is um, you can query bytes from the memory. That is uh, nice if you just want to get a single integer or so check that it's set to the correct value. Uh, you can query registers, which is very nice for automatic debugging. For example, if you say this should really fail, you can make sure that it failed at the correct address and for the correct reason. You can query even variables because we loaded this debug file, so you have all the niceties that you want. And then this is having not a machine interface, but you can still use it via PyGDB because it's agnostic. Um, for that, you can just dump things to a pile. This is really nice if you want to make sure that the full state of your machine is what you expect. This is very nice if, for example, you're hashing some uh, some passwords client side, as we just saw, and you want to make sure that that hash is exactly what you would expect it to be, right? Um, of course, that doesn't give you the runtime uh, guarantees, but it guarantees you that the computation has been finished correctly. And that one you really don't want to extract byte by byte, but you can just dump it to a file, compare the files, and again, you're super happy. And now we want to automate all of that. And since we already are in Python, it's really nice to do it in PyTest. Now you could argue, well, you have a perfectly <coughs> fine programming language running on your device. And that's true, but I kind of don't want to write a full testing framework that's also on the device because it won't be running in the final instantiation, right? So if I were to put a testing framework in there, then I would still need to test all my software after I put it out to make sure that it actually still works without the testing framework and that they didn't get a hang up. That's why having it separated by one step is kind of nice. That way I can make sure that I don't shoot myself. And another uh, nice thing that I get is I get things like automatic parameterization. Um, not shown here, but uh, PyTest allows you to basically parameterize. You remember uh, maybe from earlier uh, where it said you can parameterize about over different uh, pre-configuration values. PyTest would allow you to do that, and it gives you the ability to only run certain tests, like shown down here, where I only test the success case, and you can see that only that case is actually executed, all the others have been deselected. And PyTest gives you even one more goodie, um, which is if a test fails, um, I can just go to this directory, in this case, uh, this is my username, your mileage may vary where it's, uh, where it's at, but PyTest basically keeps around a folder for every single test. And so if you, if you have all of your configuration as what is called fixtures uh, in PyTest, then you will find all of those files in that folder, which makes debugging really simple, right? Because if you have 100 tests and two of them fail, you don't need to uh, fuss around and like set up a QMU and get the command line correct. And maybe you have some keys or some randomly generated files and they all need to match. And that, that can be easy. But if you have it this way, you can just go in, uh, do the run.sh, and instead of having uh, PyTest uh, uh, log in via GDB, you just start your own interactive GDB session you do your normal GDB debugging, and that way you can be sure um, that you observe exactly the same thing as PyTest observe, but you can manually step through it and see uh, what is happening. Um, and as a final bonus, before we get to the questions, um, you remember this was the plan, and now we want to be confident that it works on the real device. Well, it's quite simple. We can just switch this one out for the real device, and as long as you have JPEG or another way to have a GDB connection into your device, whether that is emulated on FPGA or actually physically in your hand, uh, you can just run all of the same tests and be sure that the same tests pass on QMU and on the real device. And you should really do that to make sure that um, you're not fooling yourself. Because probably in QMU, you, you, you're writing the device and you're writing the tests, right? But it needs to work on the real device. So the final or words of parting for the questions parts is please, please, please make sure you have actual hardware in the room. Questions? You should sit up front when you ask questions. <laughs>
Yeah, it's actually related just to the last disclaimer you had. Uh, how common is it that, uh, or how much based on the configuration, uh, the, the QMO, uh, how tricky is it to make it work on a board when it's working on the QMO? Is it possible that there is a lot of failures on the board and on the QMO it works pretty smooth? What is the discrepancy there? So, uh, the, the sad answer is it depends, as always, and it depends on two things, right? It depends, one, on uh, how much of the things that the board is including, how much of those IP blocks, which is basically like a UR device or an SPI device, how much of that already was in QMO and like people have strongly tested that. If you're writing your own, own implementations, you can have bugs in those implementations as well. That's, this has happened to me, that I made implementations that were different from what the device actually did. On top of that, your device itself may not uh, implement whatever it is uh, pretending to implement correctly, right? So it, it strongly depends on uh, how, how bespoke your device is. And the, more, the less bespoke and the more common your device is, the easier it is, it is to do this. And um, the, the more you're doing very weird things, uh, the less of certainty you have that, that it will just work. From my experience, uh, if you're booting, this is why I picked this example, you won't touch all that many devices. And when we moved from, from QMU to actual simulations, it just worked and everybody was looking at me and was like, no, 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 this can't be right. You did something wrong. But we couldn't disprove it, right? It just worked. Um, but then again, we were touching very, very few devices and most of those were already pre-implemented in QM. When it comes to the maturity of, uh, of the configuration, is that something that has to adapt over like a long period of time or is that are you going to reach to the limitations of the board pretty fast and then the configurations can no longer be adaptable? Um, I'm not sure I quite understand what you mean by adaptable. So uh, you, you're free to modify QMO as, as you want, right? I showed that. So uh, it is always as, as adaptable as you want. Um, as to the maturity, um, again, that strongly depends mostly on the user base and how much the different hardware vendors or open source communities have put in work to, to provide you working devices in QMO or like working emulations. Uh, so you, you're better off picking things that are popular there as well. Uh, but of course, uh, writing something yourself, if you happen to have the data sheet in hand, and then maybe upstreaming it is, uh, is just good citizenship. Did I understand that correctly? Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Everyone's hungry. <laughs> okay. Then thank I you very much.